Hi, my name is Damien Almeida and welcome to Galen Conversation With. Now, before we commence today's discussion, I want to begin with an acknowledgement of country. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Now, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Terry Numico Fuller, who is the Senior Lecturer in Digital Humanities at the Australian National University. Now, Terry is a Senior Lecturer at the National, uh, Australian National University, and her research focuses on interdisciplinary exp experimentation into ways digital technology can support and diversify research in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Her book, Linked data for the digital humanities is currently under review with Rotelich. Now, Terry's research examines the potential of linked data, open source data to support and diversify scholarships in humanities. And Terry has published extensively, and her publications cover musicology, information, library metadata, and the narrative in the ancient Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian literary compositions and the role of gamification and informal online environments in education. And Terry's also created 3D digital models of cuneiform tables, carved bulb nuts, animal skulls, and black and the black rod of the Australian Senate. Some of the things which I want to ask about in today's conversation. Terry, it's a pleasure to have you over here. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I'll join you in your acknowledgement of country and say that I am dialing in from the lands of the, the Nanawal and the Nambri, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's get started straight away with uh, the first question. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your academic background. Yeah, no, so I like it, an easy question. Like I know I know the answer to this. So like, like most people who I know in wider academia, but also especially in the digital humanities, I don't have um, a very sort of immediate and direct career path. I sort of went this way and that way. So it's a long story, but I'll try and make it interesting. Um, my, my undergraduate degree, was in ancient history and archaeology and I picked that because I wanted something that I was so passionate about as a subject that even when it got difficult or or something like that like I would have the passion and the drive to keep going so that I would ultimately do well um, I come from quite an academic family so when I was about nine I announced to my parents that when I grew up I was going to be a professor and my dad said, OK. And my mom said, Ooh, what in? And I said, research. <laughs> and that was it. We never discussed it again. <laughs> so I was sort of left to my own devices as to find my discipline. And I guess I saw Indiana Jones at a really influential age. And I was like, I want to do what this guy does. So I went into ancient history and archaeology and ended up specializing in the languages of the ancient Near East. So cuneiform from Mesopotamia, um, perhaps not so well known by everyone outside the archaeological circles, but most people will have some idea of places like Babylon um, on the in the sort of those. It's roughly the area of modern day Iraq, more or less, but about 5000 years ago. And it was in the reading of these ancient tablets that I did my first master's degree. And then I and then I sort of thought, uh oh, um, turns out not a lot of jobs in reading cuneiform tablets in a language that died out 2000 years before you know, the birth of Christ. So then I ended up doing another degree, which was in museum studies. And I thought, I'm going to be a curator, you know, I'll work with all the objects, it's going to be amazing. And then I had a chance to work in industry for a while. So I worked in museums in Finland um, and uh, in the UK and also in Egypt for a while. And then I thought, 
no, you know what? I think I think I was right when when I said that I wanted to be a researcher and an academic. So then I went back to school and I got a scholarship that was for four years for a PhD scholarship, but you had to do another master's degree to get the scholarship. So I ended up doing my third one. But the third one and the PhD were a really wonderful opportunity to bring in this knowledge that I have gathered from the previous degrees and that early academic history. So like my my personal early academic history. So my my third master's and my PhD both looked at ways in which digital technologies could be used to engage with not just the the philological, like the ancient writing and the ancient language, but also the the museum, like museological challenges of working with this material and how we could publish all of that information online in a machine readable format. So it, it was a long and winding road, but then it all came together perfectly I would say <laughs> oh it's perfect I mean I, I envy some of that as well and I do agree with you every single person I've ever met who saw Indiana Jones wanted to be Indiana Jones and just dive into the world of archaeology <laughs> I think re quite recently I was uh, on one of these webinars and one of the people who came on is uh, you know was talking about his passion for archaeology the first thing that came to mind was Indiana Jones. So I completely agree with you. Yeah. Now, Terry, I also want to congratulate you on winning the Oxford, the Gale Oxford Fellowship to the Bodleian Libraries. Um, and I believe that starts next year, if I'm not mistaken. But I was wondering about if you can tell us a little bit about that and what you hope to achieve with this particular scholarship. Oh, yes, thank you. I mean, I am absolutely thrilled to have had this, to, to be awarded this fellowship, and I'm really looking forward to going back to Oxford. I did my postdoc there, and I, I go back there every year to teach at a summer school and things like that. So just to be able to be there for um, an extended period of time and to really dedicate myself to research and that pursuit of knowledge is just is so wonderful like at the word I would need to use is it's delicious like I can't <laughs> wait it's just going to be wonderful um yeah so that the fellowship is based around um a project that we sort of started working on a little bit haven't really done much more than a proof of concept it's called liberal Sydney and it looks at us the, the landscape of Australian politics in the 1800s and without getting too bogged down with the very specificness of the project, there is an idea that the political landscape was developed and driven by a group of very dedicated individuals who were connected to each other in a bunch of different ways, um, professionally because they are in the same sort of political landscape, but also socially, and there are indirect relationships between them. So one example is that people would name their children after uh, like well-known political leaders outside of Australia to try and show like political and social alliances, right? So I actually have a co-author on the project who is a historian of Australian history, Professor Paul Pickering, and he knows a lot more about the, the domain specific side of things there. And he's very, he's convinced that there are implicit connections, things that we had no one's really identified or managed to declare very openly yet. So maybe people belong to the same social club. So they went drinking in the same pubs and those kind of um, those kinds of influences that aren't necessarily articulated mm -hmm. in traditional scholarship will have played a role. But it's pretty hard to uncover that. And we need quite sophisticated ways of tackling with that. There's also a lot of data. A lot of the material can be a bit ephemeral. Like it could be just things like a list of people who attended a party. Mm. So what I want to do is I want to use my methodology, which is the linked data paradigm you mentioned before. And I want to see if we can use that and the vast collections that are in the in the Gale collections and at the Bodleian to see if we can pull out 
like bits of information about these people that it's there, but no one's really gone looking mm. for it specifically yet. Wow. So it's going to be a bit of an investigation into what's there and what we can find, but I think there's potential for greatness here. Oh, it, it actually sounds fantastic. I mean, just thinking about the fact that, you know, you're, you're looking at party lists, you're looking at perhaps a listing of people who made speeches in a pub and just bringing all of that information, connecting those dots to form a big picture. That's actually going to, it sounds really exciting. And I, I can tell from your passion about just speaking about it, it's going to be a fantastic opportunity. Now, one of the things I also want to ask you about is that digital humanities is quite a diverse field with many different uh, kinds of approaches. Um, I was just wondering if you could sort of get us started about just talking about your approach to digital humanities. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What a fantastic question. Um, so yeah, digital humanities is incredibly diverse. We've got all the diversity of the humanities and all the diversity of computer science, pretty much just put together uh, into one group. We've there's there's different approaches to the digital humanities in terms of like methodologies. Some people love text analysis. Others want to do digital musicology and look at like the digital signal of a sound recording. Some people use, you know, artificial intelligence to try and understand paintings. There's there's such a huge plethora of diversity. But but at the same time, there's also this kind of differences in the schools of thought on how these multi and interdisciplinary projects should be pursued so some people believe very much in like a pairing of a like a like a domain expert who knows a lot about the humanities side mm -hmm. who like develops an idea and then they have like a uh, maybe like a technical developer who helps them like implement their vision and then on the other side there are people like me who thinks that everyone on the, in the group should know enough about what the other people do so that they can tell the difference between what's like trivially easy and what is mm. frankly genius, right? And so my experience because of this, of digital humanities, it's that it's messy and complicated and sometimes absolutely terrible because you don't know what you're doing. And the, the pits of despair when things are going badly are the deepest that I have ever experienced. But then as the opposite of that, the heights of euphoria when things work, it's just intoxicating. That's why we all come back for more, right? So I guess in summary, DH for me is like a drug. No, that's not for <laughs> no. Um, in summary, DH for me is an incredibly rich environment where Projects need to have a twofold approach, a twofold consideration. Mm. We want projects that increase or diversify or support that humanities scholarship where we just want to know more about a thing. But there should also be a push to develop the technological side, like challenge that mm. methodology, critically evaluate it, you know, figure out how to push it to its, you know, to its limits and and see how you can pull out those challenges of the humanities and of humanities data and see how you can use those to test the robustness of mm -hmm. your digital tool and your and your digital method so it's vibrant and exciting and yeah. and sometimes terrible <laughs> yeah well but there's also endless possibilities in, yeah. in the digital humanities which is exciting and i can tell that Definitely. as well no, yeah, what? no, and the only thing is that you have endless possibility on a spectrum from delight to despair. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like there's endless, endless potential for failure, but there's endless potential for success. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's a, you know, in a way, it's a sort of a win win because you are going to get that high once you've, you know, figured out what it is you're looking at, made sense of all of that millions and millions of pieces of data. 
Now, one of the things you alluded to a few minutes ago was talking about linked data in your methodology. I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, no, I love to. So you got to cut me off at some point or we will be here like five days later. <laughs> um, well, in, in, in summary, like in a nutshell, linked data is an information publication paradigm. So it's a way of doing things. It's a way of representing information as a graph structure. So it's not tabular data, it's not spreadsheets, and it's not relational databases. What you have is a database where its internal structure, the way the information is captured, would, if you were to visualize it, would look more like a social networking graph. Yeah. Because what you do in linked data is you identify types of information that you are interested in, people, places, events, something like that, characteristics. Mm -hmm. And you create representations and, and sort of database structures where you, where you firstly assert what things there are. There are people, there are places. And then you assert the relationships that exist between them. So a politician might have a location with which they are associated by birth. Mm. And then they might have a different that they are associated with through a rela relationship of being a representative of the constituents who live in that completely different location, right? And to there are there are international standards to make sure that your linked data is good or mm. better or best kind of thing. There's a five star standard for that, which is established and sort of maintained by. Uh, the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. Mm -hmm. And we, what we do is we use existing web architecture, like HTTP URIs, which mm -hmm. is the thing you see at the top of yep. your browser in the address bar. We use those technologies, but they don't point to pages. They point to ideas about information on a page or just abstract ideas. So... Mm -hmm. You will have one of those things that starts with HTTP colon slash mm. slash. And then it has something like mm. example slash one, two, three, mm. four, five. It won't point to a page. It'll point to the idea of a person. So for example, like William Shakespeare. Mm. And then you'll have another one which points to a relationship that he has with something, let's say, Stratford upon Avon mm -hmm. and Stratford upon Avon will have another. And all your data set is, is long strings of potentially millions of these URIs mm. put together. But that creates a graph mm. that a piece of software can navigate. And we can use that then to, to query for things, to find answers or even to infer information that isn't mm. explicitly in the graph. So it kind of sounds a bit complicated. It's fascinating and brilliant. So everyone should try it. Yeah. No, actually, I completely understood what you were thinking. And in my mind, when I was listening to you explain that, I was thinking of multiple dot points interconnected with each yes. other, linking out from, uh, you know, from person A to person B, and that B could be, you know, linking out to several locations. And in my mind, visually, that's what I was thinking Perfect. Uh, as you were explaining it. But I think that's really exciting as well. Oh, it is. And you can, what you can do is you can, you can do that with information from lots of different sources that where the places themselves, the databases themselves have completely different structure. And what you can do is when it's all represented as linked data, you can potentially query information across several places at the wow. same time. So rather than go it, log into a page, go through a search through a museum database and find the relevant things and write them down and then go to a second one, do the same search, find the other new relevant mm -hmm. things and then compare your lists. You could just query across all mm -hmm. the things. And the exciting thing is, it's not just going to a place where you know the information is at. Linked data has the potential to bring you information from outside of your domain, outside of your discipline, 
uh, that you didn't you never knew that you could even want to know mm. about like it's a complete it's we refer to them as sort of unknown unknowns because we didn't even know that we didn't know something mm. but now it's been presented to us mm. true like your example that you just said about back in the 1800s when families would name their children right. after influential politicians to show their allegiance and that's something i would have never have thought about Right. So it's something oh, totally, like totally. And it can it can get up, you know, you could ask insane questions. Well, I say insane questions, by which I mean questions that are really different from the sorts of who, what, when, where and how mm. that we're quite used to asking of of databases. So or, or even like a Google search. So what you could do is you could ask about two things like thing A and thing B, but oh, I say I only want the thing Bs that have a certain characteristic, like um, please give me a list of all the people who have been on a Gale Conversations with mm. podcast with someone with blue hair. Mm. And it's, you, you know, the, the, if, the, if the information is there, then it's retrievable and it can get a bit abstract and there aren't an awful lot of projects that have managed to do this very very well there are a few especially in the ancient ancient archaeology and ancient history world there are quite a few good ones we have one me and my colleagues built one called jazz cats which has information from four different databases and it's about jazz performance so we've got one which is about a particular jazz standards and the different sort of performances and things like that, and different kinds of recordings. And then we've got one which is very specific, like digital signal if information about recordings. So the the tempo and the you know the beats per minute, you know, that kind of information. And then we've got another one which is just about the relationships that the musicians had to other jazz musicians. So you can ask a question like, please give me a list of all the musicians who are primarily uh, trumpet players, but in this one performance played the piano, who, uh, or who occasionally played the piano, who performed or knew another jazz musician who would often perform in New York. Wow. And we, we, it's impossible to get the answer from any one of the sources, mm -hmm. but when it's aggregated and brought together, those are the kinds of questions we can ask. So, yeah, give me a list of all the people who collaborated with someone on a piece that was played in D minor in, you know, in Paris or something. And it's, it's the, it's a very different kind of question that becomes possible, but one that I think it's much more closely aligned with the way that we actually as humans and mm. scholars think about the world. And I think that's so true in terms of the digital humanities is finding new questions to ask and different ways to interrogate the data. By the way, I absolutely love the name of that project, Jazz Cats, <laughs> I must say. I did have a quick look on it uh, on, on your uh, bio page, I think, at the university. And I was reading, I must admit, I, I was browsing through it a little bit, only because I love jazz as well. And it's such a fantastic thing. And one of the other things you said about, you know, defining the tempo at which music was played, that's so apt, because tempo at, at the beats per minute can influence a person's, you know, mood, and can influence how much they participate in Definitely. the in the music, for instance, and that's so exciting. So let's go back to the uh, Gale Fellowship for a minute and talk a bit about the, the Your Link Data project. So what it is now, I mean, I've got a fair understanding of Link Data and how that sort of works. Uh, but what's your uh, hope to achieve using Link Data at this fellowship? Gosh, that is that is a very good question. I mean, to find out all the answers, I guess. Uh, well, actually, that's not even it. It's to find out what's a what's a new question uh, or what's a, a new kind of question so my my aims for the fellowship are kind of twofold like first it's just to spend some time 
searching what what material really is there um you know what can i access what can i work with does anything need digitization you know all those considerations and to just have a real deep dive into the actual collections and the actual material and and see whether there is information which is perhaps contained in a document but it's not necessarily been extracted mm. out of it yet and then the second consideration is that linked data has often been used for like quite large data sets. Maybe even you could say like in the space of big data in some occasions, a lot of my projects have been much more focused, but it's, it's quite good as an approach, I think, to aggregating information from different places, but it's not always super easy or immediately clear how you would use it for very like like unusual scenarios mm. like how would you use it to capture things that are edge cases or the things that deviate from the norm because a lot of what we do is we declare in a in a machine readable format things that we believe believe are true about the data mm. like this person is in it they are at this location so when you have data or material that's incomplete or it's very heterogeneous or it's a bit fuzzy or ambiguous mm -hmm. capturing that is is non-trivial like it's not really a technology that was ever implemented for that sort of thing it usually gets used to disambiguate because the uris that i talked about the unique identifiers nothing in the entirety of the web can have the same identifier as something else. So you become extremely rigid about defining that this thing is different from that thing. And it can work beautifully. Mm. Like you could have a father and a son who live in the same house and they both have the same job and they both have the same name. So linked data would be like historically, right? When mm -hmm. you have like apprenticeships and stuff like that, you know, like you have a, a, a job that goes down in the family, like yeah. everyone's a blacksmith, you know, that sort of thing. Or an academic. Or an academic, yeah, gosh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and so we use URIs to disambiguate between people. It's like, we're absolutely clear that that this is this is the son and this is the father, but when we have instances where for example like a historical document might be published uh and the information about the publication year might be ambiguous for one reason or another so often in things like catalogs and, and library records you'll see something like this was published in like the 1650s mm. um but that's potentially like a 50 year uncertainty mm. well, how do you explain that to a machine how do you explain mm. that lack of certainty um, about a specific thing especially because a lot of the technologies are built to like the system wants a four digit number for the year so how do you do that often we just simplify it and say 1650 mm. but i think that's a bit of a challenge like i think maybe we shouldn't be doing that maybe we should be capturing that ambiguity so that's uh, exciting. Uh, it is. We'll, we'll leave it at that. And I just want to quickly say thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with us today. We do appreciate this overall. But also, I want to congratulate you again and wish you all the best at this fellowship. I hope you discover and come up with something fantastic in your linked data project. I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about it, especially given what you've talked about in terms of the politics and affiliations with you know, individuals and their families and, and all of that is so exciting. So congratulations. I hope you get, uh, you know, everything you look forward to at the Bodleian Library. And to everyone who's tuning in today, thank you for tuning in. We do appreciate your time. Don't forget to check out the other episodes uh, on YouTube. Uh, remember, stay safe, stay well, and keep your curiosity alive.